Rock Salt Musecast Experience, Aaron and Dave. And on the line, Aaron, uh, a very special guest today, your friend of mine, Jimmy, Jimmy A. Jimmy A. All the way from Nashville, Tennessee. Yep. Who's That's enjoying really nice 74 degree cold. weather. Yeah. How's the weather out there, man? Uh, 74, really pretty. Although that will change tomorrow, I'm sure. <laughs> um, there's, there's a cold front headed our way, but we've had three or four days of just exceptionally beautiful weather. Which is great because it's been February is one of the wettest months on record for uh, Tennessee. So, oh wow, wet and cold. I'm sick of it. I've never been to t- uh, Tennessee, but I've seen pictures of Nashville. It looks like a great place. It's awesome. You know, it's grown on me. When we when we first moved here, Charlie and I uh, both moved here in 1989 with our families, and we thought it was kind of a temporary thing. You know, to get closer to a. We were doing so much flying out of Sacramento that uh, Nashville, because of the work that was being offered, uh, both Charlie and myself for that matter, it made sense to get out here because we could wagon wheel out of Nashville and do our weekend dates with the trio really easily and then come home and uh, go back to work, you know, on whatever we were working on. And in Sacramento, it would take you a day to get to the mid-continent and then you're in you're staying somewhere anyway the the weekend warrior thing from sacramento was a lot more time consuming yeah you had to build in a couple of travel days whereas in in nashville we could just hub right out of here pretty easily you know i want to i want to go back all the way to the exit record and warehouse days while i talk to you but one of the things yeah sure i was always curious about was um i always knew all all these bands you know yourself yeah vector charlie everything being out of sacramento and then one day i woke up and everything and moved to nashville what was uh yeah i mean was that well, really kind of an overnight like hey we're out of here <laughs> i mean what's the thought process it was about a one it was about a one-year process we had been uh it's kind of a long story and i don't i don't have all the you know i'm not an attorney or anything so i don't know the exact specifics but what I do recall is that we were on uh, in a partnership with a and Records, and they distributed, marketed and distributed the entire label. So they had, we had Robert Vaughn in the Shadows, Steve Scott, Vector, the 77s, Charlie Peacock, and uh, what was that metal band? First Strike. Uh, First Strike. Yeah. And so uh, what happened is when we signed to a and the only bands that went to A&M are the Peacock, Effort, the 77s, and Vector. And so when after a season, and I, that's what I don't know about. I don't know how long that was. If we were there for a year or two years, it was part of a bigger deal that uh, uh, A&M had done with Word, because we were on Word Records. Uh, Exit was distributed by Word. And people at... Uh, A&M saw Amy Grant, Russ Taft, the Exit family, and I believe maybe one other artist, uh, but I can't remember who it was. might have been Kathy Tricoli or something like that. Anyway, A&M wanted to break into the Christian market. And so they signed Amy, Russ Taft, all of the Exit fans, and... Uh, tried their best to cross over all of them. So uh, the one that actually succeeded was Amy, but it was many, many years later because that deal was cut in about 83. And by that time, A&M had dropped all of the exit bands except for Vector. And then when we came down to the brass tack, we declined the offer in an effort to stay with exit. Well, then, lo and behold, two months later, Exit cut Stephen up. <laughs> oh. So we should have we should have gone back to A and M, uh, and you know re-upped our deal there and just gone independent. But we were really committed to the community aspect. You know, we were we were in this this tribe, if you will. And if we would have done the the one-off with A and M, we would have made what became Simple Experience among other things. And we might have well had a 
pretty great career. I don't really know. That's not my job. I, I always felt uh, for every circumstance and every decision, you know, my wife and I would, uh, this sounds old fashioned, but we would pray about it and think about it and run a pro and con list and, you know, just try to be very proactive because we had long ago made a decision that we wanted to serve God with our life, i.e. we were Jesus people. So that being said, all the business strategizing and, you know, moving the, the, the pieces around the table and trying to be in the right place at the right time, it all seemed foolhardy to us. And I felt God really hugging me to just uh, pursue and exploit my friendship and our musical friendship with Peacock and uh, the uh, trio. So the trio was me saying, okay, since we can't fly with the band all the time, why don't we just do an acoustic guitar and vocal thing? And Chuck could play some piano songs if he wanted to. And that was the birth of the Charlie Peacock trio. Well, then that, that took us far and wide because it was quite excellent and it was affordable to uh, do dates. You know, we didn't have to right. pack a van with 20 people and gear. You know, I just had an acoustic guitar and a, and a rack, and that was it. So oh. we, we traveled the world that way. And actually, I think that's part of what brought us to Tennessee because a lot of Christian, uh, you know, business people, the A&R and, you know, the, the big shots that run the company sauce, and they really wanted whatever Chuck had. You know, they wanted some of that sauce on their hamburger. So that was part of the tug. You know, we had done a Margaret Becker record in California. Uh, Chuck produced, I played guitar, Larry Tag played bass. You know, we had access to all the bourgeois tag guys because they weren't yet launched. You know, yeah, and, you know, that's, in that's another one that gets forgotten because they weren't part of the exit, quote-unquote, family, right? But bourgeois no, but tag was might, around for all of it. Yeah, I mean, Chuck and I joined a band with Charlie and Brent and two other people uh, before Vector even started. You know, I even I started Vector after I'd already been playing with Chuck for about a year. And he wasn't doing Christian music at that time. He was just playing clubs, doing his jazz thing. And I loved it. I, that was more my wheelhouse than, you know, uh, for example, Please Stand By. You know, Mannequin Virtue is right up my alley. I mean, that's that's autopilot for me, barbed wire and, uh, you know, interesting arrangements that have a sort of questionable uh, root location. You know, in other words, it, it, it was a lot like the police and uh, other stuff because I hadn't had a steady diet of ECM records. Ralph Towner, a really famous instrumental guitarist from uh, – I think he's from Seattle, but anyway, uh, you know, Pat Metheny's first record, uh, all of the ECM stuff was really my cup. You know, that was what I was into. Yeah. So I brought, luckily that brought a certain voicing to, to our band that was really unique. You know, uh, I didn't play guitar like other people. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I mean, Manic and Virtue was a little more guitar driven, you know, with the exception of uh, Charlie's song, right? But yeah, uh, uh, please stand by. Does it's not for me? It's not as good as as Manic and Virtue. That was, uh, I don't know. Call me a vector purist. That was really kind of uh, man, yeah, man. No, that, that was, was the one, but. Uh, Please Stand By was a good snapshot of that era, I think. It was. <clears throat> it was. He was a big fan in those days of, uh, of Journey and uh, uh, who's the guy? Um, oh, man. Oh, guitar player Peter Frampton. You know, oh, that okay. Whole, Peter Frampton kind of single-handedly took over the world there for a minute. Right. And, you know... That in combo with uh, Genesis, uh, King Crimson, you know, we were big XTC fans. Um, I'm sorry I'm not naming any Christian groups because I didn't, I wasn't a fan of any of them. You know, there were a lot of good music out there. And ironically, over, over a lifetime now, 
some of my closest fr- closest friends are those guys, you know, like the choir and right. other bands from the same kind of time frame that we all, you know, man, we, we play on all kinds of stuff together now. You know, back then it was very, uh, you know, tribal. You well, know, all the Maranatha bands and all the right. exit bands. There was this know. evolution for Christian rock. Um, yeah. you know, I mean, you had Petra coming out of the late seventies, right? And I, and Larry Norman right. and that and, whole and scene. And that was the other band that A and M signed Petra and they only, they only lasted one record too. I, I think all that was on A and M was captured in time and space. I think. I yeah. Think, yeah. I think they just had one record. The live album. But, um, do you find, or back in the eighties, you had all these great Christian bands. Okay. Steve Taylor, Vector, um, Petra was putting out good stuff. I mean, the exit, uh, records yeah. family. And did now you've got bands like skillet and red and all that. Do you find that back in the eighties, it was more of an uphill climb for a Christian band than say a Christian band now? Well, I really wouldn't. I don't know that I would be a good judge of that because I'm, I'm so far out, you know, these days, I mean, my last, my, my last toe in the water was Steve Taylor and the Perfect Foil. We did a record called Goliath, and then we did we teamed up with Daniel Smith from the Danielson Family Band, and we did a, a, a little EP um, uh, as Steve Taylor and the Danielson Foil. And then Steve got a job at Lipscomb, full-time professor, position so he had to leave the band peter went back to the newsboys and john and i just went back to doing sessions and you know john's a very busy producer arranger guy and i'm relatively busy painter guitar guy so it, it is not in my wheelhouse like you say the word skillet and i've only heard of them i've never consciously listened to their music and i've never heard of the band red so for me, I think part of the, the the answer to your question has to do with cultural shift. You know, back in the in the eighties, we were like trying to sneak in there with some Christian, you know, sense and but be in the regular market. These days, these bands, you know, like you've got Tooth and Nail and, and all of these labels that, that kind of concentrate on heavier rock and roll band stuff and i have no idea what any of that (laughs) (laughs) well um, i just don't i just don't pay attention i want to i want to come back and talk about your art uh aaron you had something well i i wanted to say you you mentioned the choir have you heard their new stuff i have not okay i'm aware that they they're maybe are they just finishing one or they just put one out um the last i'm gonna say four years they put two albums out themselves okay. and so it's and very it's, it's very good release. stuff it's updated just like your record i think it's it, yeah. it, it's vectored to one degree but it's very now music you know it's updated mm-hmm. um yeah well i it like does, that those guys are very very enthusiastic music friends i spent a lot of time with both gary and steve more time with steve than gary but um i know that you know he's he's listening to the polls, you know, and he's such a great producer and such a great uh, lyricist. And that combo of Gary and Steve is just unstoppable to me. I hope they make records forever. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a fantastic album. Um, their new stuff, and I had no idea how good of a songwriter he was until I saw yeah, him um, at a festival we went to, and they were doing acoustic set, and he started explaining the songs. And I just found it to be fascinating um, how he wrote um, certain songs. And uh, yeah, no, he's, he's, a, he's a great really lyricist. Well, and, and beyond yeah. that, I mean, I had seen the choir once at Warehouse Ministries way back in the day. And, uh, yeah, right. uh, and we went and saw, um, well, it wasn't, it was the choir. Yeah, the choir. It, Mike Rowe played with the choir at Joshua oh. Fest, yeah, and they did an acoustic set as well. And Mike, uh, Mike's got an interesting sense of humor, so he he kept yeah. the ball rolling. It was funny, but um, yeah. uh, Derry 
Now, like I said, I've only seen him once. I don't really know the guy, but w- I was sitting in the crowd uh, while Mike was playing an acoustic set and Derry was going to be up next. And uh, Derry just randomly walked up to me and said hello and started talking to me. He's a very nice guy. Yeah, he's a sweetheart. He's really shy. You know, he's the unlikely front man in a way because he has got a lot going on in there, but he's pretty, he's pretty demure. Well, and, you know, some people, you just get a positive vibe, you know, when you shake hands uh-huh. from them. Or, and, and that's what I got from Derry when, when he came up and said hello, was just this yeah, positive he, vibe I, off of I him. I adore him. Yeah. I want to come back and talk to, talk to you about your art, Jimmy, but we're going to do, we're going to do some songs here. Yes. Uh, yeah, sure. You got anything lined up Aaron? Uh, we'll do some vector. All right. We'll do some vector on On rock salt music cast experience. Rock salt music cast experience on the phone with, uh, Jimmy a of, um, well, you name it, Aaron vector. What's that? (laughs) A bunch of stuff. A bunch of stuff. Uh, Vector, Charlie Peacock. Uh, did you, you played on some uh, 77s tracks as well, didn't you? I did, yeah. I was in the very beginning meant to be the bass player in the 77s, and then uh, Jan Eric Bowles ended up doing it uh, because I had already committed to this other thing. Anyway, long story, but I did end up playing on a few songs on uh, Seven's record, and I helped them quite a bit with their music videos and uh, different art direction kinds of things. You know, I, we were all a big team. You know, that, I really miss that those days. They were a lot of fun. Yeah, I was going to mention that. I was going to mention that it, that um, even uh, what are we thirty five years after Exit Records? Now you guys still are quote unquote the exit records family aren't you i mean you're still kind of a family yeah i think so yeah i mean i don't stay in touch with robert vaughn i don't i don't know what became of him but all of the sacramento folks you know i'm still in in deep friendship with you know nothing nothing has ever uh, rocked the boat there you know sometimes there's just uh, uh those moments in time that everything clicks just right and that whole yeah. exit records thing was just right yeah, that was one of those occasions. It was remarkable. I got try, try repeating that, man. That, I don't know how they did it. it yeah, amazing. yeah. Um, it was lightning in a bottle, brother. Um, mm-hmm. You also do art, and I didn't know this, but you did Charlie Peacock's "Lie Down in the Grass" cover. I did. I did the "Lie Down in the Grass" cover. I helped Steve Scott with uh, "Love in the Western World," maybe. Um, Obviously, we all had a big hand in the Mannequin Virtue and uh, Please Stand By. The Mannequin Virtue record is a photograph, a uh, painted over, airbrushed photograph of my oldest daughter, Alexia. She was, I think, two at the time or maybe three. And uh, so I've had my hand in in the art, art side of things from the very beginning, yeah. I, I did not know that. Now, uh, by the way, anybody that's listening, if you want to purchase any of jimmy's art it's right there at, at jimmy is it jimmy a bag Jim, dot com yeah yeah and i'm about to repopulate it most of, you know i have been i'm handicapped i'm blind so I, I can't use a computer so i i have i'm at the mercy of a digital helper and uh it's a, been a slow process trying to find somebody to help me with all of that and i think i have somebody in place now so we're gonna try to get uh that current again uh, I'm launching a Patreon uh, this next week, and that would also be a good place for people to go because it, it, it's, I'm, by design, it's going to be a very affordable. I'm not going to have tiers. I'm going to just have one level and hope for the best. And if you join my Patreon, you get access to everything top to bottom. So oh, wow. I'll be, you know, I'll be sending out some random art prizes. I've got... I'm about 60% done with a little home studio recording situation. So I'm working on three individual records of my own. And so my plan is to put demos uh, and sketches on Patreon every couple of weeks of what, what I'm getting ready to do. I've got a new affiliation with some friends in New York. Uh, these kids have a, well, they're not kids, they're in their 40s, but they're kids to me. And they have a record company called Old Bear, 
and they have uh, insinuated that they would love to distribute my work. So I'm I'm pretty excited about that. But That's it, awesome. It, 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 reintroduction back into the music world and you know i'm i haven't been uh slouching or trying to time out on the music thing I'm, I'm very 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 busy so you know that just kind of goes unnoticed because i don't produce you know stuff that can be released yeah. so i'm i'm in the process of fixing that as well patreon is going to be a really helpful motivator for me because that will that will be kind of a deadline oriented uh, situation. Whereas my Shopify site, which is jimmyadeg.com, which will ultimately have all of my archives and lots of other stuff, uh, it's just a long process when you're when you're me because I'm I'm so it's just so hard to find a helper that that works. You know, I need extraordinary trustworthiness because I can't see. Um, there are some qualifiers, you know, for, yeah. for finding somebody that could really be helpful to me. Well, if I was in Nashville, man, I'd be right there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thanks, Aaron. Yeah. Well, no, that's Dave. Aaron's. Yeah. <laughs> but oh, that's okay. I, he would too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I do want to. I well, do want to. It's going to work out. I mean, God is caring for us uh, every day, and I. I don't let stuff like that bother me. I mean, I hope I can get it kind of rectified, and you know, so many people think I'm just you know dead or something because I you know once I went blind my. Social media rhythm is off. Right. You know, the, a lot of stuff. You know, I resigned. I used to tour quite a bit with Kevin Mack. You know, he and I would go out and do shows together. Uh, I would support him, of course. And, you know, I had to resign that because I don't travel easily now. Right. And I can't see a pedal board anymore. You know, there's lots of, lots of reasons why I'm better off staying here making art, writing, and, and making music. Well, I did. And I've got the perfect scenario for that so. i did want to do this um i want to get uh the uh, last time we talked you called it the man with juggling balls or something like that uh, yeah, I want, yeah yeah you've got that on your website and i want to get one but can you sign it for me yeah they're both they're, i have four left i did i did a batch of 10 and they were expensive to print because they're archival paper and you know, a special kind of uh, printing method that is long, you know, lasts longer than us. And so those, those, those prints were quite pricey. Uh, I think I paid about $77 a piece. Wow. For those prints. So I have to sell them at twice that. I think I don't even remember what the price is on. I think it's one fifty. Yeah. So one fifty plus shipping. And I had Chuck sign them all with me. So they're all signed with me and him. Oh, wow. I, I absolutely would love one, and uh, yeah, when when we're I'll done set talking, one aside for you. please sure. do, please do, because I will uh, uh, go online and and take care of that. But you have really, yeah, that'd be great. You have really cool stuff on there, other stuff on there. I mean, there was yeah, I have a lot of a lot of small works, but ironically, most of what's on my site right now is gone. I mean, it's sold. Yeah, there is a and lot of I sold out on the there. Ability. What's that? I said there is a lot of sold out on there. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm about to rectify that. I just met with you know Tom Galata. Do you know that name? No, I don't. He's the guy that's helping me. He just moved here from San Diego. He was part of a company in Southern California and still is called Reeling in the Years. Okay. And they do archival music footage licensing. They they produce DVDs and if you go online and look up uh, Reeling in the Years. Go to their YouTube channel because it is unbelievable. They probably have 900 live performances going all the way back to the 50s. Oh, wow. You know, the, the, the folk and blues festivals, the Newport uh, Jazz Festival. Uh, they've done a series on jazz. They've done a series on blues. They've done a series on country. He moved here to help the Crook and Chase people archive the countryside of, of music. And he's uh, helping me. He's been helping Terry Taylor for 30 years. He's kind of the DA's right-hand man, and uh, he runs Terry's Patreon site. Okay. So, um, Tom is going to help me get all of my Jimmy life uh, digitized and, and up there for all of us to enjoy, including me. Yeah, for prosperity. We need you, yeah. we need you around, Jimmy. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, and, and it's funny. There's no, there's no real uh, uh, hurry up. I mean, I don't have an agenda. I, obviously, like everybody, I'd love to make a living, but I don't, I don't really have an agenda about uh, getting anywhere with all of this. I just, I just produce a prolific amount of work, and I just have to have a place to put it. So, um, I also wanted to dive in to, you got a really interesting story, because uh, you grew up in Nebraska, right? Yep. And mm-hmm. and you hitchhiked out to California? I did. How was that? More, more than once. More uh, than once. It was great fun. It was great fun. I loved it. You know, I was with a group of friends. I was, I had just turned 18 and graduated high school. I went on a thing called Outward Bound. And when I graduated, that was my parents' uh, end end plan was that when I graduated, we would pack everything up and relocate to Sacramento as soon as I got out of high school. And so they went ahead and moved. And then I caught up with them after Outward Bound. Outward Bound was a five-week wilderness uh, training course that was really uh, wonderful. And so when I got back to Denver in probably in July, me and my friends hitchhiked. I was bound to hitchhike home. And we went through uh, the Four Corners and down through the Grand Canyon and Las Vegas and then on into L.A., uh, you know, Southern Cal. And then we hitchhiked the rest of the way to Sacramento. And then that's where I stayed until roughly 1989. Wow, that is a crazy journey. I mean, that's a long distance to... To be hitching. Yeah. Yeah. It was a trip. Back then you could do it though. You know, it, it was it doesn't it sounds insane, but uh you know, it was pretty commonplace. I had a guitar and a backpack. My my other friend Jim had a guitar and a backpack, and then the other two guys didn't weren't musicians, they just had a backpack. But we you know, somehow, man, we, we managed wow. to eke our way out there. Yeah. I'm sure it took a couple of weeks to get to Southern Cal. And I know for a fact it took two weeks to get home because we stopped on the way home in all sorts. You know, I'd never really been to California as an adult. I was there when I was maybe 10 or 11 or maybe 12. But, uh, you know, talk about a, a, a culture divide, you know. I mean, it, California was really something. Oh, uh, in the, yeah, back in the 70s compared to Nebraska, I'll bet you it was night and day. Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, you can't. There is no comparison, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so now, I'm assuming that you picked up the guitar pretty early. I did. You know, I I took piano lessons as a second and third grader, and then I hung that up, and I played guitar like a little bit, and then I got drafted into the. Uh, I was raised Catholic, and I got drafted into the uh, folk mass. And instead of guitar, I played bass. And so I stuck with bass all through high school and played a little bit of guitar. But then when I got saved at 18, on that trip, by the way, that hitchhiking trip, um, on my way home, I got saved. And when I got back to Sacramento, I felt uh, really, I guess you'd have to say called, to be a guitar player. So I started playing guitar and I started leading worship and, you know, all the things that you do if you're a guitar player and a Christian and a kid. So um, that is is correct. I kind of came to it a little bit late, but, you know, my tastes were uh, quite different. You know, I mean, I was big into Hendrix and Blind Face and, you know, all of the typical stuff, uh, even, you know, Joe Walsh and the, the James Gang. And, you know, I, I could point to numerous uh, influences in my early in, in my early guitaring life, but, uh, you know, when I found, uh, Pat Metheny and some of the more jazz oriented, especially acoustic guitar stuff, that's kind of where I headed. And, you know, the band thing, I think that's what made my guitar approach in bands so different is that I didn't, I didn't come up learning the histrionics of electric guitar. Ironically, a few weeks ago, like I said, Phil, Shaking our pretty good friends, and he, he stops by occasionally, and uh, we have an afternoon of playing guitar. And I gotta I gotta throw this in, Jimmy. 
Phil yeah. Kagey. Phil Kagey is an amazing guitar player. Unbelievable. Nothing like it. He's from another planet. I mean, I, I'm I'm sincere when I say I can keep up with him, but man, that's about it. He is so uh, gifted and such a uh, um, savant at the instrument that it is it's just remarkable. There's no, there's nothing like it. You can yeah. do an interview with Phil. Hey, uh, you want to help me set that up, Jimmy? I'll interview Phil. I would I love to talk to Phil. Easily. I'll hook that up for you easily. Oh, yeah. that would I be fantastic. Now, he's if I... Recently, Go ahead. He's recently decided to quit touring, so he's got a lot of time on his hands. Oh, okay. And I'm sure he'd love to do that. Oh, that would be fantastic. with a couple of... I I remember to get a couple records on vinyl, and my son-in-law is a uh, runs a record company, and my son-in-law is helping me line up the ducks so that Phil can get a few of his records on vinyl. Oh, that We're would be fantastic! On right now. We're trying to get that one. I on, and uh, I remember seeing. Oh, I remember seeing Phil. Um, at Warehouse Ministries way back in the 80s. And if I remember yeah, right, me too. if I remember right, he's, a, he's missing a digit, he's, isn't he? He's missing a fingertip. He's missing a half of his third, what would be his ring finger on his right hand. Okay. So it doesn't, uh, so, it doesn't uh, affect his guitar playing that, that much then. No, well, it, it, it does probably in a way because he doesn't have the finger picking. You know, he doesn't have all of his digits, but thank God it wasn't on his left hand, right? Right, right. Okay, uh, Aaron's telling me i got to take a break here. We're going to break, and then we'll come back, and we'll finish up with uh, Jimmy A. What, what do you want to throw in all here, right. Aaron? Uh, let's uh, throw something from uh, Steve Taylor and uh, Perfect Foil. Great, and then we'll come back and talk to you about Steve Taylor and Perfect Foil. On That'd the Rock Salt Music Cast Experience. To. Rock Salt Musecast Experience with Aaron and Dave and on the line, Jimmy A. from Nashville, Tennessee. From uh, Well, you might know him from Vector or Charlie Peacock or the Jimmy A. Uh, solo Rich stuff. Rich Mullins. I spent a lot of years with Rich. That's right. Rich Mullins and the Ragamuffin Band. How was that experience? Great. It was awesome. Oh, my God. Life-changing. That guy was really something. That seemed like a, a, a real turn a, a departure from all the other bands you'd been in though yeah it was and i'll tell you uh, the the motive was multi multi-faceted one of them was that i needed to make a living and i could go be a side man with uh rich and kind of replace what i had been doing with the peacock trio uh because chuck retired that uh shortly before vince committed suicide and so we were we were kind of done with that era plus chuck was getting way way deep into production you know he barely had a charlie peacock thing at all anymore so i had to go find something else and i didn't have to go find it it came to me you know he came and saw me and uh within a week or two asked me if i'd be up for uh being his guitar player for a tour and after one tour i did the next tour and then another tour and then we made liturgy legacy and a ragamuffin band record which i think is amazing and then we toured that and then we made brothers keeper and toured that and then we were planning the jesus record and then rich got killed accidentally and we continued for a few years but then after that i was kind of i was ready to not do anything for a minute but the the real motive was that I have three daughters and a wife and a life, and I had to figure out how to support that. Right. And so I did a lot of section work and a lot of uh, road work with Mullen, DC Talk. I used to go out with those guys here and there. Uh, that turned into a pretty steady thing with Kevin when he would do solo days. And uh, I just kind of became a utility guy that would play with anybody. You know, I so, wasn't a... Uh, I wasn't a DC Talk fan so much when they were out. Yeah, me neither. Um, but we saw, at the same time I saw the choir, we saw Kevin Max, and he did an acoustic thing as well. 
Yeah, and I, I was instantly a fan. I mean, he did a cover of oh, he's David, a great singer. Yeah, he did a cover of David Bowie's Heroes acoustic, and I went, I'm yeah, hooked. Do that every yeah, that was amazing. And um, does he? I don't think he has that an, on an album, does he? I don't think so. I don't. I don't know if he's ever attempted to license that. Ironically, I talked to Kevin yesterday, and we're talking about doing something together again. I should propose that that he do some cover well he just the, did a cover uh, of david bowie's as the world falls down oh, okay oh he yeah did. yeah he did the cover and it, you know it's I, not I, heroes he but <laughs> yeah but he's That's he's funny he did a um a, a, he redid the uh oh you met um larry norman um album oh he yeah redid. yeah no i know about that one yeah and, uh, what was that called we all just got involved in um, this Randy Stonehill 50th anniversary record. I have a couple of tracks on that. I'm playing. I I worked with Ainer and we got uh, Michael W. Smith is a really good friend of mine, so I got him to, to do a track. Kevin uh, did. We did uh, uh, lung cancer. Maybe is the song we did with Kevin. Uh, with Smitty, we did. He wanted to do. Uh, I've got news for you. But anyway, it, it is funny, the Wayback Machine. Painter calls me the, uh, who is that guy, Forrest Gump? <laughs> I'm the Forrest Gump of Christian music because I've played with everybody. I've played with Larry <laughs> Norman. I've played with Keith Green. i played, you know, all happenstance. Just here, play guitar with me tonight. You know, That's, that kind of thing. It seems but like. I, I have an experience with an awful lot of Christian music people. You know, it, it seems like as we talk that, you know, you kind of lived your life. God, God provides, you know, this exactly seems, right. It, and that's the feel I get. I mean, I, you know, we're, we're talking on the, uh, the phone here and I, I, I don't know you, but as we talk, I just feel that you kind of lived your life like, like the, um, when you, uh, hitchhiked. You know, yeah. all the way to California, you just like God provides, and I th I think that's just great how you have lived your life and, and yeah, it's not God for is everybody, but it yeah. Works for us. Well, it just you know it, it's just an example that you know that we should know as the world we live in today that that God's going to take care of us, and and it seems like God has brought many many people in your life, and and I want to get how did you meet Steve Taylor? Well, that's a really funny story. I okay. met him at the warehouse, um, you know, back in the 80s. He would come through town, and we would chat. And we, we got to be kind of casual friends back then. I want to tell you, interrupt. Did, I saw him every single time he was at Warehouse Ministries. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah I saw him yeah, every saw single him time. Well, um, he invited Vector to open... For him, he was doing a record release party at the Music Machine in Los Angeles, which is a club, and it was a very big deal because he was like the most outrageous artist on Sparrow. So they they agreed to let him do his record release party and uh, live show at a nightclub, and he invited Be uh, Vector to open for that show. So Chuck and I and Steve, and at the time it was a guy named. Uh, what was his name? It was a drummer that wasn't Bruce. We hadn't found Bruce yet. But uh, anyway, that's when we really met formally. But, you know, over the years, we would run into each other. And then when I moved to Nashville, he had a band called Chagall Guevara. And Chagall uh, was very active. Uh, the, trio, the Charlie Peacock trio was very active. And we would end up doing... Uh, we never played, we never, you know, we were never on the same stage together that I can recall, except for maybe Greenbelt, which is a big festival in England back in the 80s, you know, a big, you know, 50,000, think uh, Cornerstone times three, you know, it was really huge. Right. And uh, so uh, fast forward a little bit, uh, Steve started producing. Actually, here's another fun thing about Steve. When I moved to Tennessee, uh, Steve Griffith followed me about six months later, maybe eight months later. And by that time, 
Steve and Debbie and I and my wife were hanging out quite a bit. Debbie, as you may or may not know, is a painter. She's a fine artist. And so we were all becoming fast friends. And um, Steve moved to town into the same apartment complex that Michelle and I lived in. And uh, we, I, didn't ha- I didn't have very many friends here, but I did have Steve, so I called him, and he came over and helped us empty Steve's truck. You know, like, again, Steve's the hero. But anyway, we became fast friends over, over the years, and then uh, after the Newsboys ended, uh, Peter and Steve talked about starting a band with John Painter, and uh, both Peter and John really wanted me to be the guitar player because I'm kind of un, unseen at this point. You know, I'm kind of a little MIA. And John Painter, being such a huge, Mannequin Virtue fan wanted that guy in the band. So, and John and I were really good friends, but I had no idea that they were trying to cook up a, an arrangement to get me to join their band. But I was so happy when they asked me. And of course, we got busy right away. And it took a few years to finish that record because of Blue Like Jazz. We had to make that movie in the middle of us recording that record. But, you know, we were never planning to tour it. We were planning to use the, that music as film and TV licensing songs. In fact, we have a whole bunch more. In fact, I was with Steve recently. We were talking about maybe doing another Steve Taylor and the Perfect Foil record. I hope we get to do that. Oh, not oh that would be oh, awesome. Please do. Uh, I, 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 as a teenage kid, huge fan. Um, I remember seeing Steve Taylor with Celia Walsh, and I felt so sorry, so sorry for her. Because the whole crowd yeah. was yelling, Steve, 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 and she had yet <laughs> to come out yet. Yeah. And uh, she seems like a very no, wonderful, he, wonderful lady. She's great, but he's a magnificent front man and just a terrific uh, creative genius. Well, I, I just adore Steve. And he knows how to command a stage. You know, there's lots of... There's lots of groups that I go to see. I go, wow, they were really good, but uh, that front man really needs to work on taking control of the yeah. stage. And uh, But Steve... Steve's got it down. Yeah. When he came out to the Perry Mason theme, I forgot what tour it was. That was the... Um, I predict. I predict. And when he came out to that, I was yeah. like... Because I used to watch Perry Mason with my mom, and he came out to the yeah. theme, and uh, he was just... A genius. I still show you know, people yeah. the video from uh, I blew up the clinic, and they're like, "Somebody, some Christian made this. <laughs> What's this about?" And they, they, you know, at the end, everybody's laughing about it because he plays that ice cream man thing. But oh, right, and, yeah. And he took the Newsboys just to another level when he exactly. started when he started directing or producing their stuff. Because when I heard Shine, I'm like. That's a Steve Taylor song that the Newsboys are doing. And then I saw he was producing their stuff, and I was like, man, this is awesome. And so um, he just took them to another level, and now they're yeah, Steve, you know Christian music Steve all-stars, basically. He, uh, he helped them uh, make all of their masterpieces. Yes. Yeah. Now, uh, personally, Jimmy, Jimmy, it, What's your favorite out of all the records that you've done? What would you say is your favorite uh, musically? Mm, boy, that's tricky. Uh, wow, I I can't I can't single anything out to tell you the truth. There's there's a few records in recent years that I absolutely love. And then there's a few records in the past that I would say are the best. So let's start with the past for me, mannequin virtue followed by probably, uh, a liturgy legacy and a ragamuffin band. And we're just talking about recorded music here. Um, and then third would be my own solo record, entertaining angels has a depth and a, it just sounds fresh as it sounds like I made it yesterday. It doesn't have any of that trendy, you know, it doesn't feel like it was a record from 1991. It feels like I could have made it yesterday. And then fast forward, you know, the perfect foil record, Goliath is just 
outstanding. The new Vector record just kills me how good that is. And I would say uh, I play, I did a record with an artist by the name Sean Michelle. He's a blues singer. Uh, Aaron Smith played drums and I played bass. And that record is unbelievable. And that's not even out yet. I wish it were out so you could hear it. Uh, but it's not. They're they're in some sort of a legal problem too. Oh, that's so unfortunate. I bet you that's really cool, really, Aaron. <laughs> really good record. Yeah, it's really fun. Well, you know, manic. So I would say those are my six. Manic and virtue um, is is definitely. I mean, you can date. You were talking about how yeah. your personal record, your solo record, you could have made yesterday. Manic and virtue definitely is from the eighties. That's clear. Oh yeah, it's very much a new wave record. I mean, it's, it's lock, stock, and barrel. You can you can almost identify the year. <laughs> yeah, but vital the new Vector record, I think, is timeless. Oh, I think it's genius, and I think the funny thing about it is that the nice potpourri, Steve's influences have always been fairly obvious to me. In a way, you know, like his his infatuation with Peter Gabriel, for example. And then, uh, you know, I, I actually recognized some of the arrangements and sort of approach on this new Vector record. I, I hear the killers a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I can almost listen to what Steve has been listening to, even though I don't know what he's been listening to. So in that way, I wonder how, how this one will hold up over time. But, man, it is unbelievably fun record to listen to it, it really just, is and you know my my son is uh he's 26 he doesn't clearly have the connection to you know warehouse and exit that i have but uh i and he's got a different view of music due to spotify and all the streaming right you don't get excited sure. about going out to buy an album anymore but um i i said hey i want i want you to listen to this song I'm not going to tell you who it is because I didn't want him to prejudge it. I said, I, w I want you to listen to this song and tell me what you think. And I played him one of the new Vector tracks. And he goes, wow, that sounds like, like the Killers. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, stamp of approval, man. That's good. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, I think it's amazing, man. I, I know, and, you know, I'm leaning on those guys to do this again. I don't, I don't want to do one and leave it leave it alone forever i want to do a record every year with those guys. yeah that would be fantastic um i don't know what's changed but uh we're having a little difficulty hearing you but um oh really yeah here let me move how are how is it now? oh that's much better yep yeah that's much better okay, yeah i had to i had to go uh take a leak I figured I was gonna <laughs> I was gonna make the joke and uh, you'd beat me to it. <laughs> I was I was reluctant to tell you that because I know we're on. You know, on uh, the it's a, here, but it's all right. It's out, out there. <laughs> hey, we're all human. <laughs> yeah. Um, I you know I I keep going back to uh, warehouse ministries and I don't want to just focus on that, but it was such a huge part of both uh, my life and Aaron's life, uh, and we got to see these great acts early on, like Vector and Charlie Peacock in the 77s. Um, but you've done these much bigger things like the Steve Taylor perfect foil. And what's next for Jimmy A? Well, you know, I have a lot on my calendar. I have, uh, I'll, just, I'll just randomly tell you kind of what I think I'm up to. Of course, I paint every day, so my fine art career is a big part of our lives because it, it actually almost provides enough to make a living these days, which is surprising. You know, it takes it takes a lot to to be a, a a going thing as a visual artist, and I'm I'm doing pretty well, so that's helpful. So I won't stop doing that. Uh, meanwhile, I'm working on. Uh, a record of children's song. I have I have a a couple of grandkids, uh, a little boy Elvis that's four, and his big sister Lula who is eight. And I have spent so much time with them that over the years I've written uh, enough to do a children's record from their point of view. We do little ditties together, 
and uh, in a practical uh, sense, I write the songs, but they help me with lyrics and ideas and stories that we've shared. You know, like, for example, Lula was very scared of mice when she was a little baby, like three or four years old. And so we wrote a song called Two Nice Mice. We built <laughs> a little cart out of popsicle sticks, and the caterpillar was the driver, and we would go to the market, and the ladybug would be behind the counter, and the, the cricket didn't speak ladybug, so we had to write the grocery list on a piece of paper. Anyway, there are these re- random, ridiculous stories that I would tell the kids because I can't read, you know, I'm blind, I can't see a book, but I, I can see, you know, space. And so we tell these stories, I tell stories to them, uh, unbeknownst to them, they're just off the top of my head based on their experiences. So I've got another one called, uh, you know, my friend, uh, uh, I think I'm just probably going to be calling it, you know, my friend. And it's just a little ditty that we, we made up about her friends, you know, like when she was in pre- preschool, she had this really special friend. And then the, the next semester, or the next uh, period of preschool, she had another best friend. So anyway, we, we put all these friends in the song. Um, I've, I've just got a bunch of them. I've, I've got a prayer for Lula that we wrote. And so my goal, once I get the recording studio done, which is really close, maybe within a month or so, I'll start work on that record first. And then I have a, a record uh, worth of songs that I wrote when my mother passed away in 2011 or 10, that is. By 11, I had 12 songs ready to do a record about her, but we were right in the middle of the perfect foil thing, so I decided to wait. And in the meantime, I lost my vision. Uh, my whole life got flipped on end. We built, you know, raised money and built a, a, a studio. I mean, I can't, I'm working on a book, actually, to tell this story because it's so far-fetched and insane. Uh, and, it, and it points to God's sovereignty in a person's life. And my, my handicap, instead of hurting me, really kind of set a new baseline so that I've got a whole new life in front of me. It doesn't include seeing but all of the other senses are uh, miraculously enlivened in a, in a way that is hard to keep up with. So I've got that memoir going. I've got two records at least that need to get done. I'm painting. I'm working with Kevin on another uh, poetry and art book. Um, I'm working with a guy here in town by the name of Ben Pearson who's got a photo, uh, I don't know what you'd call that, uh, uh, present. He wants to do a little coffee table book uh, with his years with the Ragamuffin Band and Rich. So he's got about 10 years worth of photography that's all like B-roll, you know, like unguarded moments kind of thing. It's not going to be a book full of portraits. But uh, I'm writing uh, the, the byline that goes with that book. And then, um, I don't know, there's probably something I'm not thinking of, but that sounds like enough. Yeah, that's a lot right there. Aaron, I got to say, I've never been excited about a children's album before, but I'm kind of excited. <laughs> I want to check it out. Well, this will be great. unlike any children's record you've heard. Cause her, mo- her mom, my youngest daughter, had a band uh, back in the, I guess, two, between 2005 and 2012. She had a punk band called uh, Be Your Own Pet. And Be Your Own Pet... Uh, has been a huge influence on the way that I make music going forward because I kind of had, I kind of like checked out a little bit on music and wasn't, you know, I was getting back into my jazz thing. And then when she started playing punk rock and touring the world with, you know, with her band, it, it changed my mind a little bit. I kind of wanted to make work that way. So the, the songs that, that we've written are quite simple, but I think the production will be brazen and weird. That you know, her uh, Lewis' dad is a guy named Ben Swank. He runs uh, Third Man Records with Jack White, and so we we think that there there's uh, room for a pretty crazy children's record. You know, it's not going to be a, a a Yanni thing. It's going to be. <laughs> it's not going to be kids' uh, bop. Or, 
Yeah, it's not going to be that. I, I think it's going to be pretty rowdy. And that, there'll be some soft spots, too, because there are a couple of charming, I think, charming songs. We'll see. The proof's in the pudding, right? I've got all these songs. I won't know until we're partway in what it's going to sound like. But I think it'll be really fun. And I think there'll be something in there for, for any listener, you know? That's the awesome. Bar is set high. I just want to do a good record. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And and you you mentioned you're considering writing a book. Well, I am writing a book. I I'm not considering it. I'm in the middle of telling my story uh, from from a blind guy's point of view because you know this is all a big surprise. Uh, it would be for anyone, you know, to to lose a sense late in life. And for me, uh, like I say, instead of putting my cigarette out, it feels like it's lit like a whole pack because now I've got, I'm just uh, uh, obsessed with uh, completing the artifacts that I know about so that, you know, I mean, my father is 95 and that means I've got about 30 years. I'm 67, so I'm, I'm looking at the footprint of my legacy thinking okay so these 10 years i need to do this 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 and this the next 10 years maybe i can slow down a little bit and then maybe the last you know when i'm 85 to 95 i'll i'll literally play checkers that would be awesome i i'd love to read yeah. the jimmy a story i think it's a good story and it and it includes that hitchhiking trip and getting saved and a lot of remarkable things that have happened to me throughout my lifetime that brought me to the place where uh, somehow, you know, because I have 600 friends plus, that's how many I know helped me uh, by donating large or small to build this workshop that I'm in. And I, I don't know anybody else that that's happened to. You know, where your friend group have teamed up to uh, do fundraisers and raise enough money to build an actual 700 square foot, two story workshop. Yeah. And, you know, uh, if anyone wants to see it, it's uh, chronicled in uh, uh, one of the Corona spheres that Mike and Bruce put out, correct? Because I remember yeah, watching yeah. you with. Uh, yeah, Mike yeah, Mike came and we did a few songs. Steve Hendelong was here, Mike and I and Steve, and it, it was empty at that point. I couldn't move in yet. Uh, I think I moved in in about six months after we did that video. But, you know, next week, the guy that's helping me with my Patreon site, we're going to do a complete walkthrough. So look for that. I'll, I'll let you know. All right, cool. Yeah, I, I must say it was really cool seeing uh... – Seeing you guys play, and Steve was playing like a five gallon bucket and cement bags or something yeah. like that. It was really yeah. kind of cool. Yeah, we love that. Yeah, it's great too because throughout the studio, I mean, there's a story behind everything. The windows were donated, the railing was donated, the wood for the steps and the, all the molding was from my tree. We lost a cherry tree in 2011, and I had it cut up into a four inch thick slab. It was this giant cherry tree. And so we used all that wood on the interior. Um, the flooring was donated. The roof was donated. The money to do the paying of the, you know, the construction guys, the contractor. And it, it's just a, a miraculous story that this could come together through donation. And, so I'll, I'll do a walkthrough and explain how everything that, that's in here came to, to be in here. It's just insane how uh, both uh, miraculous that it exists, and then on top of that, my own personal gratefulness is beyond measure. I mean, not a day goes by that I'm not in here just thanking God for what, he has pulled together in my favor. It's something else. Well, you certainly are a humble man, and and uh, it's clear that you are loved, Jimmy A. <laughs> oh yeah, I have a a, a a pretty thick layer of care. Yeah, wouldn't you say? I I and would that's say the way the church should be. You know. Yeah. 
Well, Jimmy, thanks for joining us today. Aaron, did you have anything to add? It looked well, like you were uh, going to say um, something. Uh, so how can they get a hold of Jimmy A? Um, dot abeg dot com. Is no, that how here it is. Jimmy, J I M M Y at Jimmy Abeg dot com. Okay, that's my email address. Okay, my but, website of course is yes. Jimmy at I mean Jimmy Abeg dot com. Okay, and then starting in a week or two, you'll be able to go to uh, uh, Patreon slash Jimmy Abeg. Okay, awesome, that's great. All right, well, thanks, Jimmy. Yeah, in fact, that's that's up and running. It just isn't populated yet, but people could go at least get familiar with me because my film is there and uh, a good a good bit of uh, copy. So, and in another month or so, there. Please email me, and uh, anybody that that's interested in following me. I mean, that those are all good ways to do so. Perfect. Awesome. And all I'll right. look forward to another one of these. I, Maybe we could do it again. I I feel like we barely nick the surface but that's okay i feel the same and yeah. i was going to ask you the same thing so that would be awesome hey jimmy thank you for coming on today and uh we'll do some more what what are we doing here aaron awesome um some more vector some more sure. vector all yeah. right let's do it awesome rock salt musecast experience